We began around 1000 BC. A group known as the Iranians settled in, well, Iran. About 200 years earlier, the entire Near East faced the Bronze Age collapse, which saw the destruction of Mycenae and Greece and the Hittite Empire, as well as the receding of the Assyrian Empire, the fall of Kassite Babylon, and the decline of New Kingdom Egypt. The world had entered into a dark age of sorts. That was to change, however. Around 850 BC, Assyria's luck began to change, and they conquered Upper Mesopotamia and heavily influenced the Neo-Hittite states. Around this time, the Iranians split into two groups, the Madai and the Parsa. They began to go their own separate ways. The Madai continued to chill in this area, but the Parsa migrated south towards Elam. By 670 BC, the Parsa established their own kingdom next to Elam. We'll call this the Kingdom of Anshan, named after their chief city. Anshan would be the origin for the great Persian Empire that was to come. Meanwhile, Assyria was conquering literally everything. All of Mesopotamia and the Levant was theirs. The Kingdom of Urartu, the traditional enemies, was already under heavy Assyrian influence. Even the Madai were paying tribute to Assyria. Around 664, Assyrian King Ashurbanipal had conquered Egypt, and Assyria was the largest empire in history up to that point. They even crushed Elam and subjugated it. Though, the Assyrian kings had the world in their clutches. It was not to last. After the death of Ashurbanipal in 631 BC, things went downhill very quickly. Almost immediately, Assyria's vassals stopped paying tribute. In 626 BC, Babylonia revolted from Assyrian rule under Nabopolassar. The Madai began to form their own empire, called the Median Empire. Why is all this important? Well, with Assyria losing power and the Medians gaining power, this meant that the Persian tribes now submitted to Median rule which, as we will see, will have great consequences in the future. After less than 15 years, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, had fallen. The last Assyrian stronghold was Haran, but it only held out for three years, following in 609 BC. This is the traditional date for the fall of the Assyrian Empire, and it was to never rise again. The fall of Assyria and the Assyrian Empire definitely deserves its own series. But after all is said and done, the new powers were the Median Empire and the New Babylonian Empire. Anshan slash the Persians, as mentioned earlier, saw self under Median influence. The Medians themselves continued to expand. The king, Shaikh Saris, the same Median who helped destroy Assyria, expanded to the northwest, bordering the Kingdom of Lydia. This would eventually result in the Medians and the Lydians forming an alliance to protect themselves from the troubles of the future. If only they knew. After Shaikh Shariz died in 585, Astyages ascended. His reign was generally peaceful until its final years. Astyages had his daughter, Mandani, married off to the king of Anshan, Cambyses I. Young Cyrus was the result of this marriage, and he lived the life of a Persian prince. He learned how to become a strong warrior, how to ride a horse, and how to shoot a bow. It could be that as a result of these lessons, the young princely Cyrus would eventually turn into the great world-conquering Persian king that we'll come to know. There are many legends of Cyrus's birth. Perhaps the most famous is the story of Astyages' visions. Essentially, he saw this grandson, Cyrus, who has become a great conqueror, and as such, a conqueror of the Medes. He ordered his general, Harpagus, to murder his grandson. Harpagus, for some reason, didn't kill Cyrus. Instead, he left the infant to die. Cyrus later began to grow up, and he got in trouble when he was still young. Apparently, it was so bad, he had to be taken to Astyages. It was then discovered that Cyrus was indeed Astyages' supposed to be dead grandson. Astyages takes his anger out on Harpagus by killing a cooking Harpagus' son, and then have Harpagus eat his own son unknowingly. Not a great way to keep your general on your side. And this would surely backfire for Astyages. This story is probably not true. There are a lot of myths and legends surrounding Cyrus, so it is difficult to know what truly happened during his early years. Realistically, what probably happened is that he lived as a prince in Anshan, and became the Persian king when Cambyses I died. Cyrus became known as Cyrus II, and he immediately got to work. He tried to unite the Persian tribes, as they had been tired of Median overlordship. Unity was key here. If the Persians fought the Medes when they themselves were divided amongst themselves, they would be doomed to failure. 
Cyrus, however, was successful in uniting the tribes, and they prepared for war. Around 553 BC, Cyrus invaded the Median Empire and made good progress. Harpagius, one of the Median generals mentioned earlier, defected to the Persians, which must have been a big blow to Astyages. In 550 BC, Astyages tried one last desperate attempt to defeat his grandson. He struck at the Persian heartland near Pasargade, the future Persian capital. He almost won, ending the war with a Median victory. However, before all was lost on the field, the Persian women bravely appeared on the battlefield and boosted the morale of the Persians. At the end of the day, Cyrus was victorious. He finally sat on the throne of the Medians in Ekbatana, and the Persian Empire had been founded. The Kingdom of Lydia was not very happy about the shift in geopolitics. Remember the Lydian alliance with the Median Empire? This technically made Cyrus and the Persian Empire enemy of Lydia. Lydia was a powerful kingdom in Anatolia, based in the city of Sardis. It is most famous for being the first place to coin money. Croesus was eager to deal with Cyrus. He wasn't sure of invading, however, so he decided to ask a god for help. Croesus was very knowledgeable in the Greek world, and he knew about the Temple of Apollo and the Oracle of Delphi. He figured that if he asked the Oracle, which received its answers from the god Apollo, he would know whether to attack Cyrus or not. And so, Croesus traveled to Delphi and asked the Oracle his question. The Oracle famously replied something along the lines of, If you invade Persia, you shall destroy a great empire. This was great news. Croesus was now extremely confident of victory. Around 547, he crossed the Halys River, the border of Persia, and invaded. Cyrus learned of the invasion, and the two armies met at the Battle of Teria. It was indecisive, and Croesus retreated to Sardis to wait for allied reinforcements. Since it was now winter, and campaigning season was over, Croesus completely expected Cyrus to wait and not pursue. Croesus was wrong. Cyrus continued marching after Croesus until he reached Sardis. Croesus tried to attack Cyrus at the Battle of Thimbra, but he failed, as Cyrus placed camels in front of his forces, which scared off the leading cavalry. Sardis was besieged, and in 546, it was in the hands of the Persians. It's commonly told that Croesus' life was spared, and that he would become an advisor to Cyrus, but it was probable that Cyrus had been executed. With this, the Lydians were no more. Cyrus had Harpagus go to Ionia, which is inhabited by various Greek city-states. One by one, the cities were subdued, and they were under Persian control. I'm sure this won't cause any major conflicts in the future. Cyrus itself would become a key city of the empire, and it would be used as a base to expand further west. After the conquest of Lydia, Cyrus continued campaigning, notably to the east. He conquered Bactria and the Saka. Adding to this conquest, he also pushed into Armenia. However, Cyrus was to have another legendary campaign that changed the entire course of world history. Remember Babylon, the nation that teamed up with the Medes to conquer Assyria? Well, they weren't the best rulers. Nebuchadnezzar II just trashed the Jews and forced them to live in Babylon. In fact, the Babylonians were really just harsh to their conquered subjects in general. Nabonidus, the king of Babylon in Cyrus' time, wasn't helping to get rid of this negative image. Nabonidus was possibly connected to the murder of his predecessor, and he was definitely not a popular figure. Nabonidus really liked worshipping the Babylonian moon god, Sin, and not really caring about the other ones. Well, that was a problem, because he didn't really pay attention to the god Marduk, which some Babylonians saw as sacrilege. People began to resent Nabonidus for his favoritism towards Sin. To make things even worse, he traveled to the desert oasis town of Tema, which was pretty far from Babylon, and he stayed there for 10 years, leaving his son, Belshazzar, in charge. Essentially, the Babylonians felt abandoned and hated by the king. This is why today, some may view Nabonidus as insane and crazy, but if you ask me, this is probably just character assassination. Nabonidus probably wasn't crazy, but this does portray him as an extremely unpopular ruler. For some reason which isn't exactly clear, Cyrus invaded Babylon, using the hatred of Nabonidus as a pretext. It's possible that since Babylon and Lydia were allied, Cyrus viewed Babylon as an enemy. At this point, Nabonidus returned to Babylon, worried about the Persians invading. In 540 BC, Cyrus captured the Babylonian-held capital city of Alam, called Susa. 
In 539 BC, Babylon and Persia finally faced each other at the Battle of Opus. Cyrus won the battle and began to siege Babylon. According to Herodotus, Cyrus diverted the course of the Euphrates River and marched into the city along the riverbed. Nabonidus fled and Cyrus was hailed as a hero. Eventually Nabonidus was captured and the Neo-Babylonian Empire was history. Babylon was to never have an empire of its own ever again. Cyrus had become the king of Babylon, the king of Sumer and Akkad, and the king of the universe. Cyrus was considered very kind for a world conquering king. Many sources claim he spared his enemies and he was very tolerant of the religions within his massive empire. He allowed the Jews to return to the Levant and helped with the construction of the second temple of Jerusalem, causing him to be called the Messiah. For an empire of that magnitude, it was actually internally peaceful for the most part. Cyrus created this atropic system so that his massive empire could be governed efficiently and stomp out the chance of revolt. Cyrus was also a great builder. He had a love for gardens, a trait some of his successors would share. He would also oversee the building of a palace in Pastorgade. Also, just look at this tomb. Just amazing. Cyrus also constructed a postal system, something Persia would become extremely well known for. However, all great kings, no matter how much land they conquered, must die. And the Greeks wasted no time describing that the Masagate people beheaded him in battle and soaked his severed head in blood. Or wine. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. In reality, Cyrus probably died of natural causes. Still, who doesn't love an entertaining story? The story goes that Queen Tamaris denied Cyrus's hand in marriage, as she knew Cyrus would annex the Masagate. Cyrus, steamed, decided to invade the Masagate because of the advice of... Croasis. He's back. Cyrus managed to get the entire army of the Masagate drunk and then killed them all, except for Tamaris' son, who then promptly killed himself after he was freed. Tamaris then hopped on a horse, gathered an army, and crushed the Persians. And like that, one of the greatest kings in human history is dead. <sighs> this is the traditional story of Cyrus' demise. But again, natural causes is much more plausible. Despite Cyrus' death being possibly inglorious, his legacy is anything but. As I mentioned, he was named a messiah by the Jews. He was well respected by the Babylonians, the Medes, and his own countrymen. Even the Greeks, the Greeks, respected him. Cyrus was able to forge the largest empire the world had ever seen during his time, and it would last for two centuries following his death. His successors would continue to build upon his foundation, and the Achaemenid Empire is known as the greatest empire of the Persians and the Iranians. This series on the Achaemenid kings will continue following with the reigns of Cambyses II, Bardia, and the rise of Darius I. <sighs> so, we're back We're back here at the uh, unedited audio outro. Um, thank you for watching this video. Uh, I'm sorry it took a little bit to make it. I was busy, you know, I had to deal with midterms. Plus, I'm not the most productive person in the world, so that had an effect probably. But uh, thank you for all of your support. We just... At the time I'm recording this, we hit 100 subscribers, um, which, again, is crazy, but, uh, yeah, thank you for supporting me. Uh, community, so, I checked the community poll, and it seems that Ancient Egypt Part 3, uh, has won, so we will be returning to Ancient Egypt in the next video, so, uh, I can't wait to see you there, thank you for supporting the channel, and thank you for watching this video.